The meeting will come to order. We have several items on today's agenda. Three nominees have been listed on the agenda for the first time and will be held over. Sarah Hill for the District Court of the Northern District of Oklahoma. John David Russell for the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Oklahoma. Ramona Manglona to the District Court of the Northern Mariana Islands. Today we will again vote on two judicial nominees who have been referred back to the committee due to a procedural issue with our previous vote. Given that these nominees have already been debated at length, we will move directly to those votes. We also vote on three additional judicial nominees and a Justice Department nominee. The committee will then return to its consideration of the request for authorization for subpoenas related to the committee's investigation into the Supreme Court's ethics standards. Before I turn it over to Ranking Member Graham, let me address the most recent development. On November 13th, the Supreme Court announced that for the first time in its history, it would implement a code of conduct for the justices. This came after the Roberts Court refused to act on this issue for more than 10 years. After a series of heavily reported disclosures involving several justices, and after this committee favorably reported the Supreme Court Ethics, Recusal, and Transparency Act, sponsored by Senator Whitehouse. Among other things, the new code addresses the need for justices to uphold the integrity and independence of the judiciary by avoiding impropriety and the appearance of impropriety. But the court's new code of conduct falls far short of what we would expect from the highest court in the land. First, as this court statement on the code specifically notes, and I quote, for the most part, these rules are not new. That's a tell. It was the old way of doing things that brought the reputation of the court to a new low in public opinion. Under the court's previous practices, justices accepted lavish gifts and luxury travel from individuals with business before the court without disclosing these gifts. Without a new, stronger ethics regime, how can the public trust that the justices will indeed ref refrain from such an impropriety in the future? And there is no enforcement mechanism in the court's announcement to hold justices accountable for violating the code. While the code of conduct prohibits the appearance of impropriety, it allows the justice to individually determine whether their own conduct creates such an appearance in the minds of, quote, reasonable members of the public. This is something the justices have repeatedly failed to do over the last few years. Without an enforcement mechanism, this code of conduct, while a step in a positive direction, cannot restore the public's faith in the court. Because of this, congressional action remains appropriate and necessary. The committee's investigation of the court's ethical crisis and these subpoenas in particular are key pieces of our legislative effort to establish an effective code of conduct. My Republican colleagues claim our efforts are motivated by my disagreement with the court's recent decisions. But I first asked Chief Justice Roberts in writing to address the court's lack of enforceable code of conduct 11 years ago. And an enforceable code of conduct would apply to all nine justices appointed by presidents of both parties. One Republican claimed that I am, quote, opening Pandora's box, but I am only seeking subpoenas for two people who have refused to comply with this committee's oversight request for months. Contrast this with the Republicans' unprecedented subpoena authorization in 2020 for a crossfire hurricane investigation. They provided the chair with blanket authorization to subpoena more than 50 named persons and an unlimited number of unnamed persons. Unlimited. In that case, committee Democrats circulated 22 amendments, 16 of which we offered for a vote. The vast majority of those amendments related directly to the subject matter of the subpoena authorization. In contrast, today, committee Republicans have circulated 177 amendments, the vast majority of which have nothing to do with the Supreme Court ethics crisis. Both Leonard Leo and Harlan Crow are central players in this crisis. Their attempts to thwart the le legitimate oversight efforts of the Congress should concern all of us. As I have said before, I do not seek this authorization lightly and do not uh, ask for it often, but to protect Congress's authority and advance the committee's efforts to implement an enforceable code of conduct for the Supreme Court, it is necessary to seek authorization to pursue compulsory process with respect to Mr. Leo and Mr. Crow. Before turning to the ranking member, Senator Graham, for his opening remarks, I will tell you that the standards we will follow in procedure are all 
precedent of the committee. They had been used by the two previous Republican chairmen, and we can cite the exact date when that happened.